Thank you very much. Uh, our panel deals with the topic of legal techs. These are startup companies that use digital tools and automation to disrupt the legal market, at least they say so. How do they work? What are the opportunities, threats and limits? Are they really the next big thing? And what does it mean for the customer? We we'll try to find that out. Please welcome Mr. Miriam Ballhausen. She's, she's attorney at law at the law firm Bird and Bird. Prior, she worked for the Federal Ministry of Justice and Consumer Protection in Germany. And she has written her thesis about the digitalization in law firms. Next to her, there's, oh, <laughs> uh, okay. uh, there is Dr. Christian Rumke. He's managing director of the Verbraucherzentrale Brandenburg. That's a non-profit organization that, among others, offers legal advice to customers. And further, we go with Markus Hartong. He's law and mediation in Berlin, managing director of the Bucherius Center of the Legal Profession. That is a think tank at the Bucherius Law School in Hamburg. And he is co-author of the study, How Legal Technology Will Change the Business of Law. And finally, we have Dr. Philipp Kadelbach, also a lawyer, and he's co-founder and managing director of the German legal tech FlightRight, founded in 2010. FlightRight has quickly become a kind of a role model for similar startups like HelpCheck or MyRight. So let's start. Um, may I ask you for a brief statement what your um, personal experiences are with legal techs? Let's start with, with Mrs. Bahausen. Well, apart from using it a couple of times, <laughs> Um, I advised, obviously, clients on um, software development, which is always part of legal tech. And, well, the other obvious point of, well, where I have touched with legal tech is for the, the thesis, which admittedly has happened a couple of years ago already, though. But you're still in business quite yeah. a time. Yes. <laughs> this topic. Mr. Hartung. Oh, um, I'm, I'm looking at legal tech from, from um, an academic interest and perspective. So we look at how legal markets change and, and how the digital transformation affects the traditional business model of law firms. That's the one end, and I'm looking at it from a regulatory end um, as I'm at the German Lawyers Association uh, in charge for professional regulation. And these new legal tech companies pose serious questions to our current regulatory system. And as I think that legal tech is the solution for many problems in the legal profession, I'm, I'm very much in favor of changing or modernizing the, the regulatory environment for legal tech. Mr. Rumke. Well, I... As a representative of a consumer protection organization, I try to keep a critical eye on that new industry that is coming up, keeping a um, critical eye from a consumer perspective um, to protect consumers and the consumer side and to say whether the developments taking place in legal tech are uh, good or bad for consumers because they have, of course, a lot of chances coming together with them, but there are quite a few risks which we want to try to avoid in the long run. Finally, Mr. Karlbach, as the founder himself. <laughs> um, I think uh, what we do in a way in this very specific area of air passenger rights, we, we, we really fix the problem in the legal system with, with our uh, company flight right, and as that we uh, legal tech is the, the foundation or basically enables our business because it makes us uh, or enables us to work uh, automated which uh, makes us work efficient and very intelligent which uh, allows us to, to run a private um, a sustainable business in this area, enabling access to justice and, and enabling a great consumer experience for people seeking their rights. So you're in business for quite a long time. Uh, how, what's your experience, especially in how do the air companies react if you are going for compensation for your customers? Well, I think uh, we have to look back uh, at the situation which we were facing back in 2010 when we started the company. And back at that time, there was zero enforcement. So basically, consumers uh, had, 
when they were writing uh, to airlines, I want my compensation, they invoked sh uh, some shady arguments like force majeure, and basically nobody received their money, and there was the problem of so-called rational disinterest, which means that um, you don't go to a lawyer or any other uh, organization and invest 400 euros uh, to enforce your claim when you have a 50-50 chance to get 400 euros. That's what you don't do. So basically, we, that was the situation, how airlines reacted. And when we started that, we uh, basically put some power, we were leveling the play field because we were aggregating a lot of intelligence and a lot of claims against the airlines. And first, they didn't really uh, respond positive to what we did. So that meant we had to really litigate a lot against them. And I think we filed more than 60,000 lawsuits uh, up to today. And only because of us, they had to um, hire three new judges uh, at, a, at a local court in Germany. But when we really were able to win these cases in, in court at a, at a very high success rate of more than 93%, we in a way really changed the, the play field and we changed the behavior of the airlines, not only towards us, but particularly towards us because they really started paying out the money directly to us after some years after they realized we were able to win these claims. But they also, in a way, changed the whole industry. And looking, uh, like looking at basically zero enforcement to, in, in 2010, now in 2007, I think we, we really uh, achieved that the enforcement in the European Union is in the area of 500 to 600 million Euro, uh, euros. So we, in a way, uh, changed the market, I guess. But on the other hand, you take about 25% of the compensation. Um, Mr. Rumke, what do you advise your customers if they ask you for something like this? Would you advise them go to a legal tech or rather take the 55% by yourself and try it on your own? What your uh, experience is with... Um, uh, well, in, indeed, you've uh, mentioned the biggest problem, and that is uh, that service costs between 25 to 40 percent. So if you want to get your rights, you have to pay money. And um, that is a kind of structural problem we are facing at the moment. So every one of you, I'm sure, um, has um, the experience with a delayed flight. Normally, you are the consumer, the passenger on the one hand side, and the airline on the other hand. And there's a direct connection between those two parties, and the basis is a quite, like, EU law, quite easy. And um, the best way is if the passenger, the consumer, whose uh, flight is delayed, directly goes to the airline and claims um, a compensation for a late or cancelled flight. But and at the moment, there are quite a few mm -hmm. new business models coming up from a consumer perspective, positive, but negative at the same way, mm -hmm. because you have to pay for your rights mm -hmm. and you have to mm, just give money to well-working business models. So Although there's a legal basis mm -hmm. and there's a direct connection between you, all of us, and the airline. And at the moment, but there are quite a few new players coming up and building a huge industry and earning a lot of a hell of money. And that's no good from a consumer perspective. Ms. Ms. Mr. Hartung is shaking his head. I, I can't believe what I hear. <laughs> it's, you know, these people say five or six years ago even didn't dare to claim their entitlements. And your customer protection agency, bar yours, didn't do anything to protect these people. Mm -hmm. So, um, and don't pretend that your service is free of any charge. People have to pay for, what, between 50 and 120 no, euros for your services? At five euros, That's yes. what they are paying there. And, I, I mean, if people have an entitlement of 100% and they are happy with 75, and the alternative would be to get nothing, so look at it from zero to 75, that's quite a sum. And these people go to companies like FlightRight or UClaim or all these other, because there hasn't been anyone to support these people. I can't understand that you are saying that's a risk in these companies, as what they do is basically they help people to get access to law and justice. So what's bad with that? 
It's not bad to get uh, access to law and justice, but it is uh, bad that the normal like legal system is not working very well. I agree. So there is, first of all, the direct link between you as a passenger or customer and the airline. And I'm asking the question, why is that direct link not working very well? So we should not talk about symptoms. We should talk about the origin. So where is the legal in, in enforcement by the state, for instance? I mean, there are a lot of people running around and checking bakeries. Mm -hmm. Who is grounding airlines which are not paying customers for their delay? And then, okay, there is um, intelligent industry coming up, making their money out of it. But before we talk about the symptoms, we should talk about the uh, structural problem at the basis. Mrs. Ballhausen, um, what's your um, point on this? Um, you as a lawyer, do you think the law system is overregulated, or what what can be done to fix this? Well, at the moment, I think there's quite a lot of regulation, but we also have to admit, as Mr. Hartung said at a talk we had before, um, it's worked quite well so far. <clears throat> And sorry, it has protected consumers to a certain extent also. Um, it's also made sure that I think our legal system has If they quite pay a, a lawyer. well. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, of course, you can go to court by yourself for very small cl claims, also, um, which is what we have to keep in mind. And on top of that, fees compared to other jurisdictions are rather low. I mean, it gets worse the smaller the claim gets, but um, in the end, I think it, it's worked quite well. That doesn't mean, though, we don't have to think about changing that. I mean, there are options um, where things can get changed, and if you look at the recent changes or suggestions for changes, I think we're, we're getting there slowly, but, I mean, there are steps taken, and I think legal techs like Flightright or others um, are a good start to at least start thinking about what might need to, need to be changed Could in you? the end. Could you give us a few concrete examples of what changes could well, be necessary? Maybe there is a politician in the audience. <laughs> what changes could be necessary? I think that depends on the kind of legal tech you're looking at. And I, I think there are very different types of legal tech. Um, and for each of these, there are different, let's say, challenges. Some of them might be able to get around these challenges with smaller changes to how they function. Um, Others might be able to get around that with contracts or, well, the setup they are using. I mean, I think for Flightright, uh, this is just guesswork, but um, I'm, I'm, they are not really doing the legal work without lawyers either, right? If they go to court, they have to use lawyers. So I think the structural setup can be one point, and then, of course, depending on what you want to do, you need to look at the legal provisions. And from what I understand, we're talking to look at, let's say, the... Um, Brau, whatever the English translation of this, um, well, it, regulation for lawyers would be. Um, and, well, the STGB, the, um, the penal code is being changed currently or discussed to be changed to allow some things and, I, and other laws are discussed so also. So there is a kind of movement uh, towards legal text and enable more flexible... Uh, dealing with these topics, but it's slow. It's slow, yeah. yeah. Okay. Mr. Kala, what's your experience in this field? Well, I think I want to respond to what Mr. Rumke said, and I want to agree with what he said, that there is a, a problem in the regulation, and this was my uh, initial statement, saying we do fix the problem in the regulation, and when you say you would expect that the the, the clients, the air passenger, get 100%, then it's very easy to, to change the regulation, basically allowing legal tech companies to, to basically become uh, remunerated on top of the compensation directly from the airlines because they do default. They, they play a, a not an, an, an unlawful game with the consumers on their back. And if we would have that regulation, we would be more than happy to really uh, uh, charge, uh, uh, to, 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 to give to the consumers 100%, and we want our share because uh, uh, unlike uh, your agency or unlike the SEUP, which is an, an ADR body in Germany, 
um, we're, we, we have to, you know, we have to live from, we have to be profitable because we're a private company. But this is something which, which has to be changed in a way. And, and uh, I think we would agree that uh, uh, consumer protection itself, and this is what we do, is a good thing. And, and we need some enablement. And that's basically, you know, that we can uh, get some, some on top money and not having to take it from the consumers. But indeed, you are talking about profits. That's interesting because that is the world you're living in. Um, you are also living in the world of maximizing profits. Um, Verbraucherzentralen are happy if in future time there is no further need of them because the regular, regular system or the law system is working very well. So um, you have got the intention that the system as it is today will not change at all. So if the airlines um, don't pay what they have to pay, you are happy with it. On, on that way, I am absolutely not happy with it. Christian, well, can I, can uh, I just, I, to, to get the perspectives right, I mean, we're talking about profit and profitability. The Nordrhein-Westfalian Consumer Protection Agency has been funded in the year 2016 by 45 million euro, only one country. Mm -hmm. I don't know how much money you have got from taxpayers' money. So mm -hmm. if, you, if, if you claim that he is thinking in terms of profit, what he's doing, mm -hmm. he is going to these niches and holes, the law lets open for all sorts of people, mm -hmm. and leaves people without any rights and entitlement. So what is actually happening? Your agency are doing a great job in filing claims against the financial industry, for example. Where you are not so good at, if I may say so, is to protect individual consumers. And that's the reason why these individual consumers go to companies like Flightright or Weniger Miete or whatever. My right or bank or right, right or right whoever's or so, right. Yeah. Because they get a sort of entitlement and enforcement which they would never have gotten by directly addressing the airline or, uh, or the landlord or whoever. Um, so that's happening. I think the system of your agency and these companies, you should just rub shoulders and do more for the, for, the, for the customer protection. And that's basically the solution for those people who don't get access to law otherwise. So where's the issue? Well, actually, stepping back, um, the intention is to get the legal system fixed in the ways in which it is we not... We all agree on that. Uh, but the question is whether Mr. Kattelbach, for instance, is really um, um, spending his time on that. We are actually spending the time on, like, influencing... Yeah, that's your job, so do your job. And in legal, the meantime, he's helping systems. people... To yeah, do and he's actually, you know, giving legal tax services and is being paid for it. So we are supporting legal tech, but we are not supporting that uh, you have to pay money for getting access to your rights. But and everybody you has to pay money to get... If you go to a lawyer, you have to pay the lawyer. I mean, that's, that's like the nature uh, of the system, and you will mm -hmm. never change that. Mm -hmm. in a but that's a system working well in very complicated cases. But in these cases, they are complicated. the EU regulated that quite easily. I mean, That's you can true. get from 250 to 600, differentiated by kilometers, everything more than three hours. So it's a dead easy system, okay. more or less. What do you think, how many EasyJ decisions do we have on the regulation 261? I'm sure you will answer that question. No, but what do you think? How many? I don't know. Just 37. Yeah. So, do you think that where you have 37 ECJ decisions, these are more than in any other regulation we have in Europe? This is an easy system. But, I mean, customers have to pay for your service. And that is no good. Why? You, you, you because want private the access TV and to, you the, to the legal system should be free, and the law enforcement is not working very well. Yeah, the... the agreement here and we can move <laughs> on to other issues of legal tech as okay. there may be, there are some other difference than talking about the okay, flight rights of this one. I think we, we all agree on one point, um, the legal system isn't working as it could be. Mm -hmm. So in an ideal world where my plane has, um, is late, 
I should just send an email to the uh, air flight company and tell them, hey, this was my flight, it was delayed, pay me my compensation and get the money without discussion as long as the point is clear, which I assume is pretty often the case. What would be needed to be done in the legal system to make this ideal world happen? I think we need uh, punitive damages or some kind of, of, of uh, yeah, basically it's punitive damages that if you really on a, on a large scale breach uh, mm -hmm. consumer rights, then it should be more uh, expensive than, you know, following these kind of rights. But that's what we don't, don't, don't have yet. And I think um, the, the problem is basically that on the other side you have uh, large organizations like Ryanair, like EasyJet, they are uh, extremely profit driven. So what they do is they just see the business case that it doesn't make sense to follow consumer right and somebody has to step in and this cannot be public bodies because they, they don't have the resources, they don't have the tech, everything that you needed to go into that area. And I think in a way this is what legal tech can do and I think we've proven in a way that we can do that, fix these loops Poles. And, and by doing that, we, in a way, as I said, change the system. So I think we should embrace legal tax. Uh, our organization should embrace it because you are maybe doing like the, 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 the cases which go uh, up uh, to the highest court and then we should exchange. And, and uh, I think we are like more the, uh, it's, a, it's a combination of all these different pillars in the legal system that should work together. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so, would higher penalties fix the problem? Well, before we call the state, we probably should call ourselves first. So if um, you have got bad experiences with an airline mm -hmm. and they don't pay what you are obliged to get, then don't fly with that airline again, first of all. So people say the new bio are Lufthansa and uh, other brands. Um, because they are a little bit more reluctant with their passengers and probably more service orientated. So first of all, every one of ourselves can make a decision and that decision is when I've got bad experience with an airline, if it is called EasyJet or Ryanair or whatever, with, then just next time use another airline and show them what your power as a consumer is, first of all. And then if that is not working well or just sl too slow, then I still th see that the uh, govern government and state uh, is obliged to um, realize an easier law enforcement. So they have to control. And at the end of the day, if um, there are bad airlines, they have to be grounded. But, but Mr. Rumpke, I, I think when I started, I said when we started this, there was zero enforcement, which basically means no airline in Europe has freely paid out uh, compensation to, to consumers. So that would mean you cannot change to another airline. You have to drive bus or car or whatever. And that's maybe not an alternative for, for many people. So I think it's not the solution to, to go with another airline. If you have a right, I think you have also the right to, to get paid. And if the airline's not doing it, then somebody needs to empower you, step in. And I think... That's a, that's a valuable part of, of, of the whole ecosystem of uh, enforcement. Mm -hmm. let's, let's switch from the uh, right enforcement in terms of flights to legal tax more general. Um, how, do, how could they change the way we could get to our rights in general, example for other branches, and how could they change the work, the kind lawyers work? Um, are you afraid that someday, someday a robot will do your, jo your job? Um, I'm, well, if I say no right now, <laughs> people are probably going to say she doesn't, she doesn't have the mind to imagine what robots could do eventually. Um, I don't see it happen today or tomorrow. Um, maybe the comparison that works is when you look at website design, right? There are um, preset um, websites that you can use, and if you're a small business, it will probably work for you, right? That's, that's okay for you. But if you want something that looks better and more drafted to or designed to what you're looking for, you'll probably go to 
a specialized web designer who will give you what you want. And I think currently that's the status we're looking at. Yeah, legal tech can help and can improve, maybe support um, what lawyers are doing at the moment um, by, for example, giving them better access to cases, precedents in other jurisdictions are really important. Um, yeah, just get, getting them better access, maybe pre-drafting a contract, if that's what we're looking at. But will they do what I do for most of my clients? Probably not today or tomorrow. Eventually, maybe. Um, Mr. Hartung, um, your, a study of yours uh, says that 30 up to 50% of the tasks of a junior lawyer would, could be done by robots. Could you explain that a bit? Okay. What kind of tasks are yeah. they and what does it mean for the customer? Is a lawyer uh, less yeah. expensive or more available um, to this provide? We are talking, we're talking about B2B, so advising mm -hmm. uh, commercial clients. And they very often claim about the amount of cost they have to pay to lawyers. And these costs are incurred by... Uh, reviewing documents through very expensive sources. So young lawyers are sitting there and are going through documents and documents and documents charged by the hour. And there is now software in place which is able to quote unquote read and understand documents and, and create a summary of the documents. For example, if you have to check 500 rental agreements Yep. That would cost some time for young associates to check that. And that's good for the law firm because you can charge by the hour and you generate quite an amount of profit. If you have a software in place which can read and understand these contracts and create a list saying expiry date, uh, amount of the rent, special rights and entitlements for landlords and tenants, that is replacing work what... Uh, as of today, still young people are doing. So as this technology is improving, uh, actually day by day, because that is um, self-learning software, um, times gets tough for those tasks which are done by lawyers, but which are not necessarily lawyers' tasks. So where you could have a software or technology or cheaper people to do that for the benefit of the client who pays less for these services um, by law firms. But would you 100% trust the outcome of... Of course not. Of course not. It, re it, it doesn't fully replace the work of lawyers. It, we would say it, it helps and supports, partly replaces, um, and helps, helps lawyers to focus on that, what they should do, or what they could do, <laughs> or what they are trained to do, uh, but not to run through documents and do things where you don't have to be a lawyer to do that. That's behind our thesis, and that's the reason why law firms have to change their <coughs> business model um, in order to survive for the next years. And, and technology is putting pressure on them, leveraged by clients who expect law firms to use these combinations of software and cheaper people to reduce the, the law firm's fees. What could this mean for the customer? Are there some kinds of low-hanging fruits that could be easily uh, picked when this kind of services advances? Um, of course, the lowest hanging fruits are picked already, so to say easy structured systems um, giving advice like Flight right is doing, but the perspective I would say is quite uh, quite positive from a consumer's um, perspective. Um, you've got the structured legal system on the one hand side, and on the other side there is a very well structured IT or technology system, and those two worlds are linked together at the moment. And that's quite interesting and challenging, and um, especially under the conditions that uh, the whole law industry lawyers, for instance, are very paper-based. So there is still a lot of uh, room for, for improvement, and I think there's a lot of um, motion and activity and a great perspective. Also from a, from a consumer side, Sarah, yeah. So this could make uh, law ser classical law services by a law firm more available for everyday customers? Cheaper, more available. It is only one mouse click away, mm -hmm. literally speaking. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, I would say that development is, uh, is a, p a positive, for sure. 
Um, there was a very interesting study, I think three or four years ago, saying that 80% of, of consumers who have a legal problem do not go to a lawyer because uh, they, they are afraid of the cost, they are afraid of really finding the right people, doing all the briefing him and so on. And, um, and, and what they do not like is that uh, when they go to a lawyer, they don't get uh, an, an initial nice judgment whether it makes sense to pursue his claim or not. And I think uh, this is a problem, like also lawyers, some, some lawyers in a way, uh, are afraid of, of what will come up from legal tech. And, and what I would say to them is, you know, look, if 80% of the people seeking legal redress are not yet, uh, you know, using your service, why not trying to really, by uh, embracing legal tech, make the cake uh, much bigger? Because then it's, uh, you know, it's, it's a win-win-win situation. So it would lower the threshold. Yeah, mm -hmm. you, you could just, you know, that's access to justice, It's a, as you say, and I think that's, that should be the future and uh, basically it could be good for everyone. Which kind of industries do you expect to be uh, subject to legal tax next? And maybe which kind of industries are you yourself uh, approaching? Could you tell us a few plans for the future from yourself? Well, I think, uh, first of all, uh, um, the, the, we, we have to look to, 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 to situations where you have this kind of imbalance between consumers and, and quite large uh, corporations which you know, have better resources, are better informed, have better lawyers and maybe a little bit looking into the area of, of really small claims because if the claim is really big it, it maybe makes sense to invest time and money to, to find the right guy but under a certain threshold and according to EU it's anything below 1,000 or maybe 500 really, really depends on. That's something uh, which is interesting. I mean, it's uh, it's in the out and and of course we need some data. The the the, the scenarios should be structured quite similar. So um, and and but that's like in, in labor law. It's in looking into uh, car car uh, situations like when you have car fines, car penalties, which are like in 50, 60 percent wrong. And there, you know, really bringing together uh, together technology, data, that, that could be a really interesting field and, and these are the areas we're looking into. I mean, there, there is, if you, if you go to, to the campus of FlightRide, you see a number of plates for other companies like BankRide or InsureRide and the best I've thought was AllRide. Um, so, <laughs> so that's a sort of a catch-all company for uh, entitlements to come. But if you find something where you have an imbalance between consumer and company, and you have entitlements which can be standardized and automatized, that's the precondition <clears throat> for a legal tech to scale a business. You know, if it's very on, on a very individual basis, you have to talk to people. Legal tech makes it possible that you talk to a chatbot, which is an automated dialogue system, or you just enter uh, some, some fields on the screen. So the, the, the less individual your issue is, the better for, for legal tech. Mm -hmm. Now, at the moment, it's going in, um, uh, in rent law. Bank law, insurance law are very uh, susceptible to legal tech services. My right is different in so far as it just collects people to, um, to claim against a Volkswagen because there is no class action system in Germany. Um, but we have to wait and see which, which other issues will come up. But as it gets cheaper to found these companies to come up with a first prototype for a solution, um, if, if there is a new opportunity, you would probably spot it without writing large business plans and go to investors. Mm -hmm. um, so th these companies will have a future from a consumer perspective, indeed, the, the small claims are interesting because the smaller the claim is, the less normally um, is it attractive to, to engage lawyers because they would say, no, I'm not working for a, a 100 euro. And the mass claims are interesting also. So small claims and mass claims, I would say, from a consumer perspective, are those one which uh, legal um, tech companies should go on. The last word is yours. Mm. Your, your vision uh, of a dream kind of legal tech, what could it be? Well, the dream kind would, as Mr. Hartung said, already prepare the contracts in a way that you, you spot what's important and you don't have to go through all the 
all the clauses one by one um, and would kind of point out where you might need to double check. Um, that would definitely make it easier because you could basically just kind of put aside all the clauses that are either not relevant in that case or just the general wording that you find in every type of contract. And from what I understand, that's being developed currently already, so might be out there somewhere. So you're also <coughs> looking forward on more sophisticated tools for lawyers? Well, I think they are at least an option you should consider. Um, it, it will make it easier and it has the advantage that it could improve the work lawyers are providing um, because it, you don't have to deal with that many words. Okay. So thank you very much. Are there, yeah. <laughs> are there any questions from the audience? You get We've to talk in left. the talk box like this. Oh, he's okay. You get the you get the black talk box. <laughs> Hi there. Um, so I was partly outside. So just tell me if I missed it, and you already talked about it, please. Um, this question is probably going to Mr. Hartung. Um, you talked about well, the first part was long discussions about you know claims and automating claims and so forth. Um, if you look more into the future, and that's also something that should be done on an event that like this. Um, Topics like when you go to Estonia, you've got an e-notary system. I've got an e-residency card from Estonia. I can open a company in Estonia from here, from within this room. Um, the whole legal system there is, is digitalized with e-notary, digital signatures, everything. That's common over there. It's a small country, but it is common. Um, there's a company called Agrello. They're developing one of many companies a whole system where you can have contracts which are digitally signed, then linked to the blockchain and so forth. These are like developments that are happening in other countries right now, um, partly also happening in Germany, and I think that we'll have like an even greater significant shift um, than just you know, like giving lawyers better tools to do their work more efficiently, you know, using a computer rather than a typewriter, I know that's the next iteration, but where do you see that? from a, when okay. looking at Germany? Um, uh, th that's a good question. That's not directly what we mean by legal tech. But anyway, that's the question of how to digitize a society and how to digitize government and administration. You don't have to go to Estonia to find that. You can go to Austria. So all small, could you go small countries? Uh, oh, we are off. <laughs> um, small, small countries which uh, with only one government have the chance to make progress in that regard. In Germany, the issue is that everything which has to, uh, which has to do with the judiciary is what we call Ländersache. So it's in the um, responsibility of the German countries and there is no chance to coordinate that and make real progress. So the, the reason for the slow progress is that there are many governments and many justice ministers discussing that. I'm, um, I think this puts it at big disadvantage to other countries, but that's where we are. And I don't see uh, rapid development within the coming years. Thanks. Another question? I don't want to hit the gentleman in front of you. I'm good at throwing it, but I'm not that hey. good. Hey, guys. Um, so I'm, I'm the founder of AirHelp, actually, so I'm, I'm very much... Uh, United with Dr. Philip you know, on the side there. Um, but um, so as we have been growing the company, uh, what we have seen as the biggest challenge uh, was especially geographical expansion because law by default is national. Uh, so to really to create a, a global service within legal tech, uh, then uh, there are certain challenges because you need to have presence in all these different countries. So how do you see that play out? Will we get the Googles of legal, legal tech or the big companies, or will this be scattered into national companies, just like law firms are today, or, or can we bridge that gap somehow? That's for anyone. That's for me or that's for Philip? For you. <laughs> um, I think that's a dream of having one common or even global market where you can buy your services you need on the, on the, on the cheapest basis and, um, and have the world as your market. Um, that's actually an issue in Europe, as Europe is a very fragmented union of, of countries. 
but at least uh, 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 the, the flight rights of this world benefit from the European Union, which you don't have with other customer protection rights. It's, it's changing step by step, but I don't see a sort of global flight regulation all over the globe so that flight ride in Potsdam could serve flight customers from wherever this plane was laid. Um, this is, you, you would hope for that. I don't see that, I don't see that <laughs> coming. I see there are Asian markets and there is a US market and there is a very interesting European market trying to sort of harmonize um, their, their, their systems and their regulation, but even that takes, takes time. So don't bet on that too early. And last question to the gentleman behind you. Hi. Um, um, I've got mixed uh, background, sorry. Uh, I come from Australia and England. Uh, I'm in the process of starting a privacy business. Um, and part of that, I'll be collecting user information. Um, one of the next steps I have to do is incorporate a company. Um, unfortunately, in America, uh, security uh, uh, corporations have full access to data from American companies, so I cannot incorporate in America. Uh, Australia is part of the Five Eyes movement, so it gives information over as well. Something that's really impressed me about Europe is, is on a social level, people understand privacy is important, but also legislation is now coming out in 2018 with the general data. Uh, hopefully I'm speaking to the right audience here. Um, as a company that wants to protect individual consumer information, personal information, is Germany the right place to incorporate? One, is there the right laws that are coming out next year? And is there the legal tech infrastructure that could support me? So for example, in America, if I want personal information, I can just get it. But you know, do people have to go through the front door? Like, uh, your company has information about a user. Oh, I've got a court order. Can you please give it to me? So I, I guess to the open panel is, uh, do you guys have a background understanding of, of uh, privacy? Is Germany the place to come to, or should I go look elsewhere? Sorry, long question. Well, if you want, I think if you want privacy, Germany is a country you could look at. Um, we have been rather regulated with regards to data protection. And um, my point, or, well, my idea is, or take on this is, that we've now successfully managed to expand that law to all of Europe um, and put something on top of it. So I think, um, yeah, when you really want to protect data, um, but also want to be bound by really strict rules, you should look at Germany. Or, well, probably all the other European countries as well, um, as they will have the same rules applying. May I, may I add to that? I would have said go to the United Kingdom, uh, because <laughs> yeah, it's, more, true, <laughs> it's more flexible on setting up a company, uh, and, and in particular, if that company does uh, legal advice or provision of legal services. Germany is not a good country for that because the um, the legal provision monopoly is very large for lawyers. So legal tech companies have a hard time. I would rather go to Poland. Um, I would rather go to France to do that. Uh, Germany is very well for all established systems. It doesn't has the, it doesn't have this great. Um, founding environment, making it easy for companies to be set up, you know, overnight or so. We are not Estonia, we are even not Austria. Uh, I'm sorry to say that. So if you're looking for that, don't go to Germany. Awesome, that's all the time we have. Thank you to our panelists. Give them a big round of applause. Thank you.